G'day guys and welcome back to another Citizen Tech Talk gaming and hardware video. Guys, today we're going to be discussing Star Citizen, AVX, and a couple of the new ships that have come out that are up for quite a bit of discussion, including the Star Runner as well as the Perseus. So guys, yeah, get ready and get strapped in and find out why your CPU is probably not working for Star Citizen anymore. Along with the episode. Alrighty guys, so uh, basically to start the episode off, we're going to just bring up the AVX uh, issue where uh, quite a few people have come to me recently and told me that they're having problems with uh, you know their CPU not being compatible with the game. So this is something that you know um, isn't a big thing, isn't a new thing, and if you do have an older processor, maybe it is time you actually do an upgrade. Something like a Ryzen 3600X would be fine, uh, running 3200 megahertz RAM and just a B, uh, B450, B550 board will get you by just fine. So guys, um, AVX is the name of um, one of many x86 vector extensions from Intel. It's been in use since the Sandy Bridge Bulldozer series of CPUs and Intel and AMD respectively, not AMD. Bad spelling there. What is a vector extension? Traditional CPU architecture scalar processing. Operates on a model called SISD, single instruction, single data. You, I'm sure you guys have heard that before, SISD. Um, you have a processor core which operates on instructions sequentially, each operating or an, on a single set of operations at a time. Let's say you've got a dual core processor. It's doing two things at once, but it's what it's doing is splitting that one load into two and then putting it back down a bottleneck through to your screen. So what they're saying here is the single core CPUs like your AMD 64 CPUs and so on have passed and anything obviously prior to that doesn't have the capability to handle this kind of instruction set where it breaks it down to little pieces. So instead of just two pieces we're asking for four, eight, you know, or 16 now with today's modern CPUs or more. Uh, this works well for most types of workloads, but is generally ill-suited to some types of compute-intensive workloads. Consider photo editing, for example. If I wanted to double the brightness of an image, I'd do, have to do double the brightness of an image pixel by pixel, which is slow. Each pixel is actually independent of others, meaning there is potential for massive parallelism. Given enough compute resources and the right uh, architecture, could theoretically do all that work in a single operation. So break it down, as I said, in little tiny pieces through or over several cores. Enter vector processors. Okay, so these operate on a model called SIMD. Instead of the operating on a single element one by one, a vector processor concentrates many data elements into one large element, typically 256 bit or more, and performs operations on that. The result begins in the vector processing, doing much better work on data elements in a single operation when it comes to several operations for additional processes to, processes to do so. So the reason why I'm relating this to Star Citizen is a lot of people out there with first gen uh, i7 CPUs, i5 CPUs, uh, as well as obviously um, Athlon, Phenom CPUs still, and they're just not designed with the AVX instruction set in mind. If you are to look at a CPU that is going to be uh, suitable for your needs, you're going to have to look at the very beginning of Sandy Bridge, uh, which is a four core processor, eight threads, and hyper threading, as well as obviously AVX instruction set. Uh, then moving forward, obviously, through to today's CPUs uh, in relation to Intel side. Now, with AMD, uh, Jaguar-based processors were for more of your consoles, uh, your uh, PS4, uh, some PS3 stuff at the very end for the PS3 minis. But yeah, and the Xbox One, obviously, as well. Not the One X, not the, all the other Xboxes or the X360. Um, it's the Xbox One, specifically, is where this chip ended its service life. So moving into more of your, I guess, mainstream FX processors, this is what most of you would have right now if uh, you had uh, upgraded at least 10 years ago. And this is where you're kind of, you know, you're stepping that line between 
Yeah, no. Uh, because the FX processors, as we know, were terrible. So um, even if you had a 5990, uh, 5995, whatever it is, the one that hit 5 gigahertz back in the day, you are still going to have a very serious issue with frame rates and uh, dips and load times and all that type of stuff. Just because the processors really were not architecturally well built, they do not have uh, at all good single core performance by comparison to you know, even the Haswell chips, which is a 4770 uh, or a 4790K back in the day, and that's what's in my son's computer. And I saw that CPU still for sale for a stupid amount of money recently. So, um, a CPU that's really held up with the times and it matches up with the 3600X uh, in its own right. So that should give you an idea of how far you can go back if you can get a great deal on one of those processors, you know, an LGA 1151 board and, and some DDR3. You know, if you can, go budget and you'll be fine on a 4790K for quite some while to come, which is pretty impressive for such an old CPU. When we're talking about AMD though, Go Zen, go all the way. Don't, if you can afford it, great. If you can't, get yourself an X8350 and get, um, I don't know, 24 megahertz RAM, uh, DDR3 24 megahertz RAM, if you can get some, 2233 is okay. But um, you're not, yeah, you're still going to have a 4790K or even a, um, uh, a 3700K really. Um, really smash that CPU by comparison still and still give you a better experience. So guys, if you have anything older, Star Citizen has just recently basically raised the CPU prerequisite minimum requirements floor from first generation i7 to AVX level processors, as you can see here on the screen now. So uh, there's the, the tech news for Star Citizen of recent and uh, not something that they've really put out publicly which I find a little bit rude and uh, typical of Cloud Imperium's behaviour of recent, just quietly doing things and quietly screwing people over, in this case in a far minority, but still. Why wasn't this publicised? Why wasn't this explained? And why wasn't there, you know, some form of public statement made about this uh, on video by CIG in the first place? So moving on. All right, guys. So everyone's talking about the Mercury Star Runner, right? It's a smuggling ship. It's a, it's a data running ship. It's uh, something kind of doesn't really have a role kind of ship. It's not a smuggling ship. By any stretch of the imagination, a merchantman's going to do you far better. There are much, much, much better uh, hiding space on um, CU space, the whole bit, uh, and and that's what the Banu you know specialise in. So go, if you're going to do a, a smuggling ship, go with a merchantman straight away, no questions asked. This thing, it's like that kid in school when you're picking teams for bull rush or basketball or hockey or whatever it is. And you're, you, got, you come down these last three kids, yeah? And they're great at other stuff, but not the activity we're playing. That's what the Mercury Star Runner is. It just doesn't really have a place outside of the Sol Star System, uh, which is Earth's, you know, solar system. If you take this thing out to anywhere in the, in the outer verse, you know, it's a sitting duck. It's not that fast, it's not that manoeuvrable, it's not that heavily armed. Yes, it carries more data than a Herald does, which we'll get to in just a moment, but it's not a ship that's going to change the way you play the game. It's going to be a ship that kind of doesn't really know what it's doing half the time. It is more of a commercial vehicle than it is a privateer vehicle. It is no way in any way an espionage vehicle. It is more of a commercial, corporate kind of, you know, data runner uh, for whatever it is, uh, propaganda or marketing or uh, moving, you know, large files from one location to another uh, for archive. It's not, it's not really a ship you'd want to use for too much smuggling. It'd be great for things like relics and things like that, you know, small things uh, that you can hide in these is under under deck hiding spaces but it's not going to be something where you're going to get great amounts of contraband into and not get pulled over in the solar system specifically and yeah if you do get pulled over and even one of those cabinets uh, get found with stuff in it by a boarding party 
and then they find everything else, well, your jail sentence is going to be pretty damn long, and you'll lose your ship. It's too high risk reward to do anything other than use it as the corporate vehicle it is, and once in a while, run a, a couple of things here and there in the, the, the hardest places to find in these smuggling boxes under the deck. So yeah, um, I, I, just, I don't see the hype about this ship. I, I don't see 275 American dollars being a good value for the ship. I would honestly sell this thing if I was CIG for maybe 150 USD. Uh, and then obviously have some people buy it. I wouldn't recommend buying it. If you've got it, melt it, buy something else. Or buy a Herald off the grey market. It's it's not going to do what you want it to do uh, as a proper smuggling ship. It uh, is very bright on radar, and you can't do anything to quieten that down. If you have any different opinions about what the Mercury Star Runner could do, also do, I'd really love to hear what you have to say. Uh, it's just, it's not a ship that makes much sense to me, that's all. Uh, compared to the Herald, and uh, obviously what you would want a data runner for, and a deep space scanner for, in the Outer Rim. Or even uh, around the solar system to work out where... That UEA forces are currently patrolling. You know, just it's not it's not that ship. It doesn't do that. It might look cool, but it's it's a commercial ship in every right. Very visible, not that maneuverable, and um, yeah, the hull plane is not that great either. So all right, let's move on. That brings me to the Herald. So with the Herald, we are looking at a ship that is the fastest ship in the game. It is designed to uh, pretty much stealth itself out and not be seen by most radars, especially capital ships, especially obviously once they turn that big monstrous engine off. It is a deep space scanning, search and rescue, espionage, data running, yes in smaller amounts, but this is more kind of intercepted transmissions between different orgs or NPC parties where... It might be a pirate faction, it might be uh, an outlaw group, it might be another espionage group. These, these little ship can then get in there behind a, an asteroid or a planet, turn its engines off, wait half an hour, wait for the other guys to come through, drop their transmissions, bang, catch them, send them off, and then sell them to the highest bidder. Or, get above a planet and listen to everything going on on the surface in communications without being detected once again, get into a solar orbit and just float around and listen in. Get all your data, you can use, use this data, you delete the great data you want, keep, and then boom, shoot off out of there as quick as lightning. If, even if you have a raiding party come up from the surface because they somehow detected you or someone's tipped them off, you know, this is espionage, that thing will get out of there before anyone has a chance to even look at it. So it is the real, what, what the Mercury Star Run is trying to be, it is the real deal. And it is going to be imperative for any Armadi or fleet to have at least one at their disposal on the battlefield. And we're talking about behind enemy lines, high risk, high reward, or hiding behind an asteroid and just trying to blend in best possible. The colours of the Herald also match a lot of colour that the asteroids are as well. So it's a small ship. Uh, it, it's got a massive scanning capability. It can um, point out enemy positions and just there are so many things this little ship can do that no one really appreciates, and I don't think uh, there's many people in the Star Citizen community to date that have actually even thought about playing real proper espionage gameplay. Now, we are talking about high risk or extremely high risk to reward, but we're talking about the rewards being 10 times that of mining for a month in your own ship. So, or even, you know, a reclaimer doing two or three weeks worth of work. You do one of these missions and you're going to get paid through the nose for it if the returning party is willing to pay the UECs from their org bank for that data, for that information. Because sometimes the cost of doing business for us is 10 times more valuable to the person who wants that information than it is to us. So when they go out and then they do their raid, they've got a reason for it, either to take out an enemy base, take it over, uh, to find a cache of hidden materials or something like that that they've been investigating, researching themselves, and need the extra data of where that location might be on XY um, axis of the planet, or to, to get dirt 
on an enemy org leader or an enemy org um, base and exploit and blackmail them financially that way. So this is this is the big part of the economy in the game. And a lot of people think, oh, this is just going to be a single player game pretty much in, in the verse. And, you know, you're not going to really come across people that often and so on and so forth. Once where they've got base building, we're talking years ahead of time, I know, but once they've got base building, once you got Armadi or battles going on, server meshing, don't have server meshing, sorry, and, uh, you know, everything else that goes along with it, I case. We are looking at a extremely complicated economic benefit situation for not just miners, not just people that hang around Seoul who are in massive competition with each other, it's for outer rim and, and for Armadi or fleet support. Now, we're going to come across another ship that's just been recently released, the Perseus, in just a moment, and I'm going to kind of segue into that off the back of this. So, this ship is imperative to the survival of the Perseus, and here's why. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, so here's the Perseus. Now, the Perseus is a gunship. It is a gunship, and that is it. That's what it does. It punches holes in enemies' defenses. That's all it does. Uh, it is not designed, as it has demonstrated here, to take out a hammerhead, for example. And this is what I find, found weird. Um, they're showing in images that it's there to defend a space station. It's a sitting duck. Um, but more importantly, once I find the image... Right. There is no way in hell you're going to have wasted the firepower of a Perseus on a hammerhead. You're going to get a few eclipses in and you're going to run and blow the hammerhead up. And why are they battling in space anyway? A hammerhead's more of a grounds atmosphere support vehicle, but just, just saying. It's a troop carrier, for Christ's sakes, with lots of guns on it. So having the Perseus in this situation would not be something you'd usually use it for. The, the forward front cannons, yes, the forward facing cannons are balls to the wall. People have asked, why are they any ballistics? Well, and this is other YouTubers, guys, which does kind of lead me to question how much people know about Star Citizen. It is a hull puncher. It is not a take the shields down and then hit the hull. It is there to punch holes in shields and blow shit up. It's a gunship. It has one purpose. Put holes in things. Um, the automated turrets on the back, I find, are very, very weak for rear support. And this is where the Herald comes in. So let's say you've got a, a wing of five of these um, Perseus gunships coming in in an arrowhead formation into an armadial battle. You've got interference. You've got uh, your vanguards. You've got a Polaris. You've got all these other ships in the way to get through to where you actually need to in the battle, and that's the capital ships. That's where these guys are going to shine. So these guys are clearing the pathways, getting rid of the Polaris, getting rid of these pest ships, sending out all these torpedoes, right? Uh, and, and hopefully change out for rockets as well, heat-seeking rockets or tracking rockets, because if these things only have torpedoes, even a Vanguard is going to get away, and people say, oh, no, they won't. Yes, they will. Right, a Vanguard can just take off and do a couple of loops, a couple of spins, boom, the torpedo loses tracking, or it flies past them. They spend a couple of minutes, you know, maneuvering away from it. If you're in a saber, this this thing is just, it's not even a threat to you. Uh, unless you get copped by one of those front cannons, that means you're a really bad pilot. Um, but when we're talking about other ships of the class, there's nothing really anti gun ship yet. And if you're saying a hammerhead is, you're an idiot. It is just, it's a new class of ship that is designed to do one thing in an Armadio battle. It is not a standalone ship. It is a ship that needs a lot of escort and support. So the Herald sends out the information of the, of the actual positioning of where the enemy is, where the capital ships are moving to, where their waypoints are, to these ships. And these ships are now manoeuvring into, into position. Now, the Eclipses have already come in. They've already put down a massive volley of torpedoes. It's a wing of eight of them, yeah? All in a nice big phalanx, bang, boom, throwing torpedoes in at all these targets to disperse 
the, the targets or do some damage already. These guys come in and they finish off what the Eclipse has started. Then they've cleared the path, then they go for the capital ships and start hammering at the engines or hammering at a weak spot of, of the actual design of the ship. For example, a javelin or uh, whatever else other ship it is. And they start going for that part, especially the hangar bay for a Bengal carrier, for example, right? If these things can um, have enough armor plating to cop all those massive cannons off the damn thing, just off the hangar bay um, surrounding on top as well. So, you know, so survivability. And there's nothing you can do to, to help these things survive. These things are going to go in, they're going to punch a hole and get blown up. That's what gunships are all about. They're not there to hang around for the long term and, and stick it out. They're there to punch a hole and get blown up. That's what they do. So the survivability of these things has to be orchestrated by someone or something on the battlefield which is going to increase their chance of survivability by sending information back to the capital head capital ship that's probably getting attacked by these these things to then send in reinforcements orchestrate um, you know a vanguard or harbinger uh, run or another set of eclipses run or even retaliators if you really want to waste your money on a retaliator to come in and really if not blow them up, defer them, and go, oh, okay, we're getting way too much heat here, we have to exit the battle and limp off back home, right? This is how these ships will play in. And all these people are going, oh, it's really awesome, and oh, I want to get laser cannons. No, you don't want to get laser cannons. These things are set up the way they are for a reason. They are a single-purpose vehicle, and that's all they do. Now, I'm sure if you're going to go on this exploration and you've got a really good... Yeah, you, you actually, is that damaged already in the photo there, down here? Or is that just the style of the ship? Um, anyway, yeah, this is the whole thing, right? If you were to take this thing deep space, which you can, you need a long-range escort and a pretty strong one. So, uh, um, wardens, uh, harbingers, um, maybe a few sabres, uh, some, maybe a hornet or two. Uh, but something, something that's going to be able to really kind of keep up and take a bit of a beating. So Hornets and Vanguards would be great. You you're going to need Sabres and some form of way of refueling because the Sabres are the intercept craft. We know they're faster. We know they're uh, just a better ship for getting in there instead of brawling and either scaring off enemy ships, i.e. Vandals, or, scare, or, or don't doing enough damage or blowing up enough ships to make the enemy think, well, oh, maybe we should back off. If not, well, then you've got your backup. You've got your Wardens, you've got your Harbingers, and you've also got your, your, your uh, F-7Cs. So it's just, it's a ship that I don't see being something that people want it to be. It is a very uh, focused, service-specific ship, and it will do what it does bloody well when the time comes for it to do it. That's the thing. Guys, we are probably only... Less than halfway in the actual ship development release cycle of the game. And this is what people think, oh, there's so many ships already, yes, but they're variants of a single ship. Or a pirate version, or a UAE version, you know, or a, a civilian version, or a war bond version. It's still the same ship. We are less than halfway. And if we keep on throwing money at every single ship we buy, sadly what's going to happen is most of the ships that you buy now are going to be melted, and you're not gonna, you're either gonna have buyer's remorse or you're gonna look back and go, oh, I can't really melt this now because now I bought this useless ship four years earlier that is now going to be maybe something I need for the Armada I'm part of, for my org. Oh, I can't really, oh, I'll have to buy another ship without melting this one. I would honestly, I'd honestly wait uh, until. Pretty much everything else comes out first. Work out what you're actually going to be doing in the verse. Are you going to be playing single solo? Are you going to be playing against NPCs only? Are you focusing on PvP? Are you focusing on org-driven armadial battles or takeovers or base building or mining or security or espionage? What are you going to do in the game? What ships do you need for you? Because there's going to be someone else in your org that will have bought this other ship like this Perseus because 
they could or they, they have only focus on Armadial battles. Some Org leaders already own Javelins because that's what they want to do. They want to have a capital command ship and run it from there. They do not want to enter into combat. They want to dictate from the top and uh, orchestrate these Armadial battles. Good. Okay, great. That's what they've chosen to do. I myself am a fighter pilot and that's it. This is way just me. But I'm also espionage and obviously data running and security support obviously of uh, mining operations and things like that so yeah black ops security kind of stuff so but we, with with this ship it is a very case use specific ship it is designed to take a beating but it's only really designed to do one major thing and that's punch holes in things to get through to things so other things can then kill those things right um, so guys, don't get too excited about the Perseus just yet. The Kraken I heard also, uh, as a side note, there was a lottery for the Kraken's uh, concepts to be put back up again. I haven't really heard anything since about, really much about that since. I am interested in a Kraken. Whether I'll buy one or not, who, who knows in the future. Obviously, you know, years off before we even get there. But if anyone's got any information about the Kraken lottery, the, uh, the Kraken carriers, please just pop off in the comments and tell me what's going on there. I'd really appreciate that. But guys, look, um, that's pretty much all that's happening with Star Citizen at the moment. I just thought I'd give you some advice about those ships. Explain why if your CPU can't uh, any longer load Star Citizen, it's because your CPU is no longer supported thanks to the new impl implementation of AVX instruction sets and CPUs uh, only that will do the job. If you are to run off an older system like a 4790K, 4770K, uh, or anything, maybe even a 2600K, I wouldn't. But anything like that, anything really in, in the 4 to 3, uh, the 4 series or forward, I would recommend. If you've got the money, do a cheap upgrade to a 3600X, you'll thank yourself. If you're an Intel, I'd still say, if you really are a, on such an old processor, I'd still say go AMD at the moment. It's the best price per bang per buck kind of purchase. And it's cheap, really cheap to upgrade at the moment. A lot of people say don't go above, you know, 3200 megahertz on a 3600X. No, don't listen to that. 3600 megahertz is the sweet spot for the 3600X. I know it's, it's kind of ironic, but 3600 megahertz will get you, especially with tight timings, will get you a really, really good solid experience from Star Citizen and a range of other games at the moment. I'm doing another video coming up, guys, after this one. It's going to be the Cyberpunk shit show. And I'm sure you guys have been hearing all about the copies from Best Buy and uh, just the dramas going on at C Project Red, the massive amount of bugs, even after 50 gigabyte patches, etc. Um, I'll do a short video on that next. And uh, yeah, we'll go from there. So anyway, guys, um, I hope you've enjoyed the video. I hope I've, I've helped you kind of realize what these ships are doing and what they should do and shouldn't do. I haven't done this before now because, well, they've just been ships that flying around in a little sandbox. Who cares? They really never had any purpose and they still don't, most of them. Once, once we get a bit further into it, I'm going to start doing more of these uh, purpose-driven ship videos and help you understand what these ships are actually dedicated to do and whether they can do secondary roles solo or not, what type of support mechanisms, if you are to take these things deep space, you would need to take with you or not uh, moving forward. So now, guys, as per usual, and as for always, peace out. Cheers.